today's show, you'll hear investor perspectives on the COVID-19 impact on the SaaS sector. This is Investor Perspectives. I'm the host of Investor Connect, Hall T. Martin, where we connect startups and investors for funding. It's the time of COVID-19. Software as a service is currently undergoing tremendous change across the U.S. The lockdown has disrupted many industries such as travel, hospitality, restaurants, and more. We have investors and startup founders describe the impact of COVID-19 on the SaaS market. Our next guest is Matt Oguz of Venture Science. Great. And so what's your advice to startups about COVID proofing their business? What should they look at to survive well and maybe yet another lockdown that may come in the future? COVID is terrible for everyone, whether that's a customer facing business or otherwise, it's it's very scary. But if your company is based on a personal interaction with a customer, in other words, you're going to see somebody face to face, you have a store somebody needs to come walk into, then those businesses are at a higher risk. Because if you're selling a digital product, you're sitting at home, you're not you're not seeing anyone. So, so you, you minimize risk on all fronts. So let's say you, maybe you have a wine store. Maybe now is the time to think about putting out maybe a podcast about selecting different wines. Uh, your experience is about selling wines, maybe some stories around the customers that came into your store before. Maybe even interview some of your customers in the past. There's millions and millions of things you can do. But essentially, everything's kind of, if it's a physical product related, you now want to think about shipping that product rather than hand delivering it. So that's, that's number one. So maybe, maybe less people are going to come into your store, but you're going to ship out to more people. So with that, you might want to start thinking about maybe subscription models, subscription programs. Parallel to that, you want to put out a message and you want to put out your experiences and thoughts in and around that particular business. So that's how you would make your business kind of uh, COVID, nothing is COVID proof, unfortunately, but COVID resistant, but also take your business to the next level. That's good advice. Well, one thing we hear a lot about is that the economy is in terrible shape, but the public stock market's doing great. And for many, that's very confusing. How do you reconcile those two things? Yeah, listen, it's about supply and demand. So I'd like to point out some numbers for all the listeners. So today, based on research done by UBS and many other reputable sources, and and I'm happy to share that offline, please all the listeners. Again, my name is Matt Oguz and add me on LinkedIn. Say hi. I'm, I'm happy to exchange notes and information. And so there is about almost $400 trillion of global wealth that's out there in the world today. Yesterday, I've seen a report, $120 trillion of of wealth in all of U.S. households. Over the next 10 years, there will be $60, $70 trillion of inheritance, a wealth transfer from one generation to another. We're in the midst of that because of the way the generations are kind of stacked up today. Now, our stock markets, I think New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ combined is probably about $50, $60 trillion. So, Our stock markets, our financial products, these stocks are the best of the best financial products in the world. Anybody around the world knows and generally accepted that the U.S. stock markets offer the best investment products in the world. And so there are a number of things happening. All of that overseas wealth, all of the free cash that's pumped out into the system is looking for a place to go. It's not going to sit idle. And so when when that capital is scanning the landscape, to figure out where to go, the U.S. public markets, with all the companies, the Apples and the Googles, Microsofts, who exceeded a trillion dollars in valuation, the Amazons, these are the best of the best of the best in the world. And so globally, there's, a, there's an increased demand to our publicly traded stocks here in the United States. On top of that, domestically, like I said, the total household wealth is at its highest point a more a lot more capital because of the fiscal stimulus plans there's a lot more capital out there so putting the fundamental numbers of those companies aside the ebitdas and so forth putting that aside just an there's just an overall increased demand into that into the public stock markets and so 
when you have increased demand, what happens to the prices? Prices go up. That's that's economics 101. And so that's what's happening. So as long as that's out there, we should see uh, upward movement in, in the stock markets. And, you know, obviously, we will all reach a point where an equilibrium will have reached. And at that point, we could see a flattening of that and then perhaps a reversal where the prices start heading the opposite direction. And so has the private market where we deal with startups and so forth, how does that correlate to the public market? Yeah, excellent point. Because the private markets are what fuels public markets because any company that's publicly traded used to be a private company at some point first, and then they go public and then they become publicly traded. And so what I see happening is that because the publicly traded companies, the public markets sort of like the semi trucks on the interstate set the pace of the road and they're going at a certain pace. And so the private companies follow that suit. So private companies, especially the ones that are best of the best, you know, the ones that are not a unicorn, the ones that are unicorns and the ones that have kind of exceeded that, that standard, I'm not going to get into whether or not a company is overpriced in terms of it's reaching a billion dollars of valuation. That's a whole different two, three hour discussion. But those companies, they have their eye on the big target. I mean, and it's no longer a billion dollars. And that big target is really a trillion dollars because once Apple hit a trillion and then exceeded and hit $2 trillion in valuation, market capitalization, and we saw a bunch of others follow suit. And then the companies that are below a trillion start approaching that. Perhaps your Salesforce and perhaps some of the other companies getting higher and higher in terms of their valuation. So on the private side of things, when these engineers uh, and these the most brilliant minds, technical minds in the world working here in Silicon Valley and, and also elsewhere around the world, one day they want to be a trillion dollar company. And so they're working with that in mind. They're working really hard. They're creating uh, amazing platforms, amazing products, but they have this big, big prize in the forefront always. And so my recommendation would be whether it's publicly traded or whether it's public markets or private markets, what has worked for us in the past is that we've always gone after the best of the best, maybe maybe one of the top three in that one sub-vertical, picking the leader companies in that sub-vertical as investments. And if you go all the way down to the end of that stack, to the startup level, you need to look at the team, you need to look at the product, you need to look at the potential for them to be first a unicorn. And then from there, is there even a possibility for that company? I mean, I, I looked at a company a few years ago and they were making a very innovative cookware, which is great. I love to cook. But if they sold their cookware to all everybody around the world, it's still a couple of not no more than a couple of billion dollars. And then we're 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 looking at trillions of dollars of companies. And so the initial addressable market is always very important, in my mind at least, and and, and many other uh, astute investors that I know. So it's a long, long discussion that I, I would love to talk about maybe at another session, but I am uh, overall optimistic in the long run, but certainly cautious and uh, perhaps a little bit scared, just like everybody else in the short run. Right. Well, absolutely. And you brought up some very good points there, help make sense of the world that we see in the public markets today. And you said hearts go out to those who are impacted by COVID and looking forward to recovering soon and getting back to the next stage. Our next guest is George Spencer of Saying Capital. Okay. And so what do you coach your, your companies to do to COVID proof their business? What are you advising them to do in case there's another lockdown? I think the answer is you always want to be prepared and you want to have your the plan that, that you've got that's going to work for you written down and, and put into a drawer next to you. So you don't have to really think about it that much if if the world goes to hell. I mean, I, you know, there's no playbook here. I mean, we can draw a, a lot on kind of what we learned 2001 after 9-11. You know, draw a little bit on what we learned after the first Gulf War. We can draw a little bit on what we learned, you know, in the mortgage crisis in 2008. But, you know, this is, this is a new animal. And I mean, how do you treat employees in this world where they're working from home and they've got to supervise their kids online learning too. So it's, I think that there's a, there's a uniqueness to this that's, that is, it's unique. 
But the question really is, the fundamentals are the same. If, if sales and marketing is working and you've got good, good sales, you got to put your foot on the accelerator a little bit. If it doesn't seem to be working, you need to tap the brakes a little bit. And that's, that's kind of what we look by, what we look for. And, you know, if you're sort of on the wrong side of the aircraft carrier when the tidal wave comes over, sometimes it's hard to hide. Or to companies, like I said, selling into the airline industry or the hotel industry or the restaurant industry. I mean, I just, you know, that's just going to be really, really tough. And those guys, you know, I, depending on how much scale you have, I'd be just kind of retrenching as much as I can, preserving cash and getting the company to break even if I could and keeping it there, or at least keeping the burn rate as, as minimal as possible. And if you're, you're not of a scale to be able to do that, then look for a merger partner, I guess. Well, that's good advice. In the last few minutes that we have here, what else should we cover that we haven't? It's a tough world. I think that as I look back, the best and a lot of the best investments I've made over the last 30 years have been in this period, in these periods of time when people were afraid to sort of step into situations just because it didn't look so good in Forbes magazine or Fortune magazine or Time magazine. But, and I just think you got to think for yourself, focus on the fundamentals. And if it works, it works and trust your instincts. And as a venture capitalist, we're always sort of looking for primary data that we can look and interpret and see things differently than other than the rest of the world. Well, very good. Well, appreciate your sharing your thoughts with us today. Our next guest is Chris Hall of Escalate Capital. Great. And so in today's market, what, what does a startup need to do to COVID-proof your business? You, you talked a moment ago about your customers and how if they're not COVID proof, you know, your sales are going to you know, take a hit at some level. But beyond that, what else do you think someone should do to COVID proof their business? At a high level, just the ability to be flexible and adapt quickly. With COVID this time, who knows what the next one will be. But more specifically, prioritize profitability, maybe over growth, at least in the short term. So it's certainly you know, it's a combination of cutting costs, but you also want to stay in a position to once things open up and it is possible to grow, you don't want to be understaffed and not in a position to get back on track with your, with growth. So, and also an element of this is think about your variable versus fixed costs because, you know, fixed costs can't change, at least in the short term variable you can. So that extends runway. And if you're just, even in the worst of times, if you're a well-run business that has Recurring revenue, predictability, strong retention, you can still raise money. Just like we talked about the public markets and how they are right now. But in other times of recessions, there's usually a flight to safer assets, right? So not companies that aren't over levered, companies that are cash flowing. And the equivalent of that in the startup world, you know, when companies are still burning money, is predictable revenue and strong customers and moderate burn. So companies like that will still be able to to raise capital in that. As long as you can keep doing that, you should be okay. And then also, this is it's a little harder to find, but if you're a, a must-have as, as opposed to a nice-to-have product or application or whatever the company is, so which should always you should always be trying to be a must-have, right? Do you mission critical as opposed to just a nice addition? So I'd say if you the sales staff or the customer experience staff or whatever company calls them if if you are in high touch a high touch organization with your customers your customers have a, a champion as well respected in that organization you're more likely to thought to be more likely as thought of as a critical component if you touch processes at your customers that they consider essential then you're you know less likely to get cut once budget cuts happen and usage too right i mean the more your products use the more likely it is to be considered that mission critical and you you can track with your app certain applications, you can track usage. So if you know a number of resources that your customer are logging in on a daily basis, like you should have stronger retention. I mean, it's not always that simple one-to-one, but I mean, even if you, you'd be better off having retail customers that are struggling financially where you are absolutely crucial to running their business. As long as they don't, even if they go bankrupt, they come back after declared bankruptcy because they need you to run the business as opposed to, a nice to have a company that's doing fine because you just might get cut without warning because who cares? Because you're not necessary. Well, that's a good point. Well, in the last few minutes that we have here, what else should we cover that we haven't? 
I guess to just back to COVID proof PPP, that whole process was, it was difficult and not exceptionally clear, but also really impressive that it, it wasn't an idea that two weeks later you could apply, you know, theoretically apply for it, but different banks. So it's it, very complicated, very difficult, required a lot of hard work, but it helped save a lot of jobs in the, in the short term. So there is certainly a difference between customers or our portfolio companies that their CFO and CEO were really on the ball and put in applications the second it was announced, as opposed to people who are like, oh yeah, we should really get on that when we have time, right? And that's <laughs> kind of joking on the last one. Everyone, everyone took it seriously, but there are certainly different levels of urgency. Because you always give the money back too, right? Some companies did that when they didn't really need it. But the ability to adapt quickly certainly save jobs at a lot of our portfolio companies, but companies in general. So today it's how do you affect COVID? But tomorrow, again, what's the next thing? But the companies that are built leaner and that have teams that can adapt quickly, there is a noticeable difference. And as far as my career as an investor, this is the first recession I've been an investor through. And I heard constantly like, oh, you know, once your first recession happens, you'll see the difference. And I just didn't see it. And then with the management teams I've I've dealt with, the ones with, you know, the gray hair, the experienced ones, they emailed me before I got a chance to email them. And they let us know about the change of plans. And the newer people, which if I was in their position, I'd be one of those newer people. I haven't, you know, managed company through all of these. I would still be trying to figure things out. So it really does make a difference on who you who you invest in. Well, that's great. Well, that's good advice and appreciate your taking time to share that with us today. Our next guest is Nick Adams of Differential Ventures. What does a startup have to do to COVID proof their business going forward? Or how does that impact your investment decision when you go look at a company? What are you looking for to make sure that they're not going to be disrupted by the next pandemic? I think the short term answer is don't give up on on sales. I think there's an initial reaction for people to kind of pull back and stop. And I think you've got an opportunity to figure out what you want your your company to be post-COVID, post-quarantine, and so forth. But you're also going to be measured on on growth, without a doubt. So to me, it's it's figure out what your best channels are to reach your customers. And most importantly, find out who's still buying. As I mentioned, we have a few companies that pivoted pretty quickly or adjusted quickly and started building up their pipeline in some of these sectors that are still buying, still going through procurement processes, still still cutting checks, still working with startups and spending less time trying to close companies in the sectors that are clearly reducing headcount, cutting costs, and, and probably have reduced budgets in the, in the near future. So that's really, yeah, I think it's just really shore up what you can do in the short term. Maybe focus on a slightly different sector or size company as your, as your target market, and just keep building up your pipeline for when these other markets come back. Well, that's good advice. Well, in the last few minutes that we have here, what else should we cover that we haven't? That's really it. I don't have a whole lot else other than I'm as horrible as this whole experience has been for a lot of people. I'm optimistic for for what's on the other end. I think technology is going to definitely play a big part in getting us all back into the into the world sooner than later. And I'm hoping it creates an awful lot of new jobs for for people. So I'm excited about retraining and and getting people back into good paying jobs through a lot of training and education platforms. And hopefully we'll have a better work experience on the other side of this, of this pandemic. Great. Well, thank you for joining us today. Great. Thanks so much, Hal. Our next guest is Jason Krause of EQX Fund. Great. And so... When you talk to your companies today, startups that are raising funding or those that have raised funding, what do you tell them to do to COVID-proof their business for the event we have another pandemic lockdown? Yeah, so one thing was have a sufficient or have a sufficient cash pipeline, and some of that may be like a couple of our investments we went in, you know, around the March time frame were like had to offer some other incentives to close quickly rather than delay and try to figure out what how long the pandemic was going to last and ease the concerns of investors there. So it could be warrants or slightly decreased valuations, other ways to 
get investors to come in today rather than waiting. On the other side too, like some of it, you know, is managed depending on the industry, managing what makes sense to budget out and spend in the short term, or if there's certain areas that you can delay and put more into if it's an industry that you're not going to get as much sales in the short term, maybe you delay some of the marketing and sales efforts and keep more of a budget for that later on. And then the other side too is like a lot of our, you know, a lot of companies have also tried to figure out, like stay true to the, I think it's important to stay focused on what your business is long-term over the next three, five plus years, but see if there's other ways that make sense in the short term to bring additional revenue streams in. And yeah, like our e-commerce fashion company there started offering mask, face masks people could buy. Other companies have shifted into like, or one of our, you know, biotech companies started issuing cream, scarring creams that can help with for some of the nurses and other employees that were affected by like wearing something on your face 24 24 7 in the hospital and other companies just sort of figured out what we what can we do over over um the short term while still keeping our long-term vision the same and keeping the company growing in the right direction good advice well the last few minutes that we have here today what else should we cover that we haven't yeah i think i think it's important for companies or sort of touching on what I was just mentioning there, like stay focused on where you want your company to grow, like what your vision of the business is and make sure you bring the right people involved. Um, I think the team is one of the most important pieces. So bring co-founders, advisors, even your investors involved that share the same goals of the company. And like, there's a lot of different pathways with startups. So you can have a successful business that either bootstraps or raises a small amount of funding and gets acquired by gets acquired by a company in the space and has a good return on investment for everyone and another company can raise a large amount of capital and either have a huge acquisition or IPO and it can be both situations can be good for the com- or good for all the stakeholders depending on what you want to do as an entrepreneur and where your strengths lie in the business. Well, that sounds great. Well, I want to thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thanks again for having me on. Our next guest is Kerry Barker of Cross Creek. And joining us today is Kerry Barker, founding managing director at Cross Creek, based in Salt Lake City, Utah. Kerry, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Well, great. Well, recently COVID's come through and made a big change in all of our lives and in many of the industries we work in. Today, I'd like to talk about the impact of COVID on SaaS. And can you give us a a brief update on what you think the overall impact was of COVID on the SaaS sector? Absolutely. Well, I think when people think of SaaS, they primarily think of B2B SaaS, you know, large software for, for major companies. And obviously, Cloud software has had a huge acceleration from COVID because as people, you know, are working from home, there's been a, a big push to get more of the applications that the employees and customers of those companies use in the cloud. And of course, that means you know moving from uh, installations that are heavily dependent on sort of physical hardware and local software to, to cloud, you know, SaaS offerings. And that's not going back. So, you know, once you've made that transition, when COVID's over, hopefully, and everybody's back in the offices, nobody's going back. So that's a permanent acceleration. We're also seeing that conversion in, you know, sort of B to SMB, sort of small business. So, you know, this might be businesses as small as two or three employees. And in that space, I think it's not a conversion from perpetual software to SaaS, it's really, it's really the adoption of software at all. So something as simple as payroll for a small business was probably being done, you know, physically writing checks, 
dropping them in the mail, you know, that sort of thing. And we've seen a, a big adoption of just moving to cloud, you know, with COVID for even the smallest businesses. SaaS is also B to C, like consumer, and people don't think of SaaS as much in that. But really, I think if if you think of something even like Netflix, you know, this is really a referring model for selling things to the consumer. And if you think about, you know, Netflix, obviously that trend was well underway that people don't go to Blockbuster anymore. They, you know, they go to Netflix. But then you think about going to the theater. I think for consumer, it's really replaced many traditional physical retail experiences where people might be using any number of uh, media uh, SaaS offerings, you know, whether they're signing up for Hulu or Disney Plus or, you know, all these things are replacing, you know, a lot of physical entertainment being replaced by SaaS for the consumer. So hopefully, you know, that gives you a sense. But I think, you know, across the board, we think COVID has been a very large accelerator for SaaS of all types. I've heard many investors talk about looking for businesses that are COVID proof. What do you tell startups to do to be COVID proof in order to raise funding or even survive another lockdown? Well, the question, I guess, is we can try and be COVID proof. There's some industries that can't. If you need to physically deal with people, elective procedures, a lot of healthcare companies that do elective procedures, they can't be entirely COVID proof. So I think the main things to make your your company sort of more prepared is obviously flexible workforce, having your, your employee base prepared to work from home, flexible environment. We talked about supply chain, really understanding just in case, not just in time supply chain. Those are all things that I think you can do to maybe make your company COVID ready. I don't know that there's COVID proof. And probably more importantly is everyone's going to be ready for the next pandemic, really thinking about it won't probably be a pandemic next time. It'll be something else. And so I I think we would counsel our companies to not focus too much on COVID. I think they've already dealt with that. And if it, if we get a, another virus or a big resurgence of COVID, they've kind of dealt with that. I, I think we're really always telling our companies to think about other major, whether they're subject to interest rates or oil prices or market swings, what are the other things, or you know, maybe a company that's subject to extreme or having more and more extreme weather, business continuity and, and all kinds of sort of preparedness is, is what we want them thinking about is is what's next, not necessarily the next COVID. All right. Well, in the last few minutes that we have here, what else should we cover that we haven't? Relative to, I think, these current changes, we, we've covered the ground really well. I think the, the one interesting change that's come out of these really volatile markets is what we've seen with IPOs and, and SPACs. And I think a lot of investors are, are thinking a lot about these shifts in the market. And as you know, the the private markets continue to sh- take a lot of share. Sorry, the, pri- yeah, the private markets continue to take a lot of share from the public markets and really gaining access to all these industries that have seen digital acceleration. Most of the companies that we feel have benefited most dramatically, while there's certainly the Zooms and the Teladocs that are public, the private companies as a group have benefited from COVID far more than the public companies because of the industry, cloud software, particularly in all the other industries that are being driven from COVID are, are predominantly dominated by private venture back companies. So I think that's going to be interesting to see how many of those companies sort of choose to become public companies for access for the, for the majority of investors. All right. Well, those are good points. I want to thank you for taking time to join us today and sharing your thoughts. I want to thank you for joining us today and hope to have you back for a follow-up soon. Great. Thank you. Our next guest is John Gu of Spring Mountain Capital. And so how do you coach startups to COVID-proof their business? What do you tell them to do in case there's another lockdown? Yeah, so... I think I think agility and resilience are the two most important qualities for survival, especially for something like this. I mean, like COVID nineteen. Just thinking back to the beginning of twenty nineteen, I don't think anyone, any of their investment analysts, thought that this was going to be a risk of some sort. 
And it was just almost a once in a lifetime sort of thing that we now have to wrestle with. For our, for our startups, definitely first make sure that the, the employees are safe. Make sure they have like a robust work from home process and, uh, and framework in place. And then to look after both your customers as well as your, your cash balances, making sure that you're, you're adequately capitalized to the extent you can. You're drawing down on the lines of credit that you may have uh, access to. And also to make sure that you are being prudent about the, the, the spend that you're, you're making. Cash is king, and especially so during the pandemic. And so making sure that you have the, uh, the operating runway to, to see it to the other side, I think it's really important. That does, that does mean making some hard decisions in a lot of cases. Pairing back my expenses, oftentimes I mean laying off and furloughed employees, and it's just it's just a, a part of what needs to be done sometimes. Well, in the last few minutes that we have here, what else should we cover that we haven't? No, that's I think that's a pretty good discussion of, of SaaS. I think that was a really good, uh, really good conversation. Thank you, thanks for those questions, by the way. But I do think outside of uh, outside the pandemic, there definitely has a world outside of the pandemic and life after that. Well, I'm curious, like for, for for you, what are some of the things you'd be curious to to, to explore? Well, it, it seems like we're getting a lot of manufacturing reshoring coming back. Manufacturing is coming back to the U.S. and it seems like that's an opportunity yeah. for SaaS. I, I saw a lot of change or challenge with the supply chain during the COVID pandemic. We're using a just-in-time mm-hmm. supply chain, and I think we're going to be moving to a robust one. And so wanted to see if there's any movement mm-hmm. in supply chain visibility systems and how that might be uh, reoriented. Have you seen anything in those directions? Yeah. So we spent a little bit of time on logistics, and admittedly, we haven't actually done a deep dive in that space. For us, like we do like to invest behind, call it the, I guess, the slow chain adopter industry. So, so companies that haven't fully come up the the or, or industries that haven't fully digitized to the extent that others have. So, for instance, logistics kind of fits in that camp. It's an industry that, compared to like uh, media or financial services, where it's almost completely digitized, it's an industry that in a lot of places you're still going to find spreadsheets and pen and paper. But we haven't asked spent as much time there to really form out a thesis. Uh, one area that we are trying to just build a better idea of is, is the real estate tech industry, because that's also like a huge sliver of GDP that historically has under digitized. And just there are a lot of patterns that are waiting to play out in this sector. So I think with the pandemic, that's really kind of uh, impacted that particular sector. And we're still waiting to see how this kind of, kind of plays out. Because with, uh, especially in large cities where commercial real estate is really being pressured, I can imagine that for the, the companies that service that sector, that this may be a, a tough year for them as well. I'm, I'm interested to see how companies, especially in physical locations, kind of repurpose their real estate. And it's not going to be a pure tech solution. I think that there's going to be like a, a hardware component to, to a lot of this too, but to see how, how uh, commercial real estate evolves as the pandemic goes on. Well, great. We also hear about an expanded use of robotics and want to see how SaaS might be playing into that. Any insight there? Mm-hmm. We admittedly, we haven't spent a ton of time in robotics. For us, we, we're, we're more a software investor, so we don't spend as much time in hardware. But when it comes to automating the, the economy, robotics does, like real robotics does have a real role to play. I know that within healthcare, that there have been some experimentation of uh, robotics both in terms of robots to, for transportation, but robots also for sanitation. These bots that patrol from room to room and actually use UV rays to, uh, to sanitize an entire room. The one area I think within, within healthcare, robotics has played a pretty tremendous role is in surgery. And so you have had uh, companies such as Intuitive Surgical, Mako and whatnot that have actually started to get real market share. And I think most of the surgical players out there, the Medtronics and J&Js of the world, are investing pretty heavily in surgical robotics, which is a pretty pretty exciting field. But for my firm, we we tend to spend most of our time on in the tech services and in the software field. Well, that's great. Well, appreciate your taking time to join us today, and hope to have you back for a follow up mm-hmm. soon. Thank you, Hal. Really appreciate your time for this uh, for this this podcast. Our next guest is JD Weinstein of Oracle. Great. And so you see a lot of startups come through. What does a startup need to do in order to become COVID proof? So in case we go through another lockdown, how do they COVID proof their business and not be susceptible to that? So this is a great question. And I think the short answer is it's really going to depend on on the business, business to business relationship too. However, something that I always suggest startups do, whether it be internal 
for your own strategy or for fundraising is to always have three different forecasts of scenarios, right? So one is selling the dream. What does everything go right? That's kind of that question that VCs ask, but the best VCs, like what hap- what happens if everything goes right kind of thing. And then this is, this is how we become the multi-billion dollar company. One you need to have, which is conservative estimates to account for churn and turnover and other unknowns. And then number three, which I think folks are paying a lot more attention to now is is your disaster scenario. So how does your business respond swiftly and effectively to right another version of, of COVID happening in, in 12 to 18 months down the road? Of course, focus on, on automation where machines can rule and customer-centric relations when, or relationships where, uh, where humans can rule too. Great. Well, in the last few minutes that we have here, what else should we cover that we haven't? Yeah, I think one idea within SaaS that, has really picked up a lot of traction lately for your viewers that are not familiar is this concept of product led growth. And so this is the idea of owning the end user. So companies that we use every day now, like a zoom or Slack or Dropbox or Shopify, these companies all focused on capturing their end user first and having that market and growing with their product upwards, upstream, as opposed to selling to executives and pushing it downstream. So I think that's a really important shift that we're beginning to see. OpenView Partners has put a ton of great research out in this space. And and a local plug for a company here in Austin called QuotaPath, which deals with sales compensation and and commission tracking, they've innovated with, with adopting a lot of these practices too. So what's the advantage of starting with the end user rather than, say, the decision maker? I go to a large company and I go to the CEO and I sell one person, everybody in that group is using it. Otherwise, I have to go and sell every individual user and then work my way up. But what's the advantage of working your way up? Yeah, so you're absolutely right. In the short term, to look at a short term strategy, it's going to be easier to get the one big signed contract. This is really looking at down the road where the most important part of your business and now more than ever is going to be looking at net retention and churn and really keeping your customers happy and owning that relationship. If you sell and you get your your end users and customers on board, it doesn't matter. You've won. So wherever they are going to go, it's going to be widely adopted You know, in the case of all those companies that, that I listed previously. But it's I, I think we're really going to start to see a, a much larger shift for this product product-led growth market. Great. I want to thank you for joining us today and hope to have you back for a follow-up soon. Great. Thanks a lot, Paul. Our next guest is Stuart Keim of Hop. Well, that's great. Well, that's good insight there. So we went through COVID and so forth, and we talk about one element of COVID-proofing your business, own your customer, but what else can they do? Well, I think the... Another interesting aspect is how COVID is affecting SaaS startups internally, because there's a lot of, in software, it's much easier for us to move our businesses online and for everyone to Zoom and Slack and use digital collaboration tools. But one of the things that we're noticing internally is it's not necessarily what people are saying. It's almost more like what they're not saying. And so there's an element of, what I would classify as a couple areas that we're missing. The morning water cooler coffee talk that doesn't have a point, there's something about how it deeper connects people in real life. And the afternoon, like birthday cake that always some, how is it a birthday 300 days in a row? I don't know, (laughs) but (laughs) that that's actually really valuable. And then, and so when you look at losing that time, the, the third area is, is these meetings that people used to complain, like, why did I have to be in that meeting? Well, it turns out that there was a lot of visibility that you probably didn't need to be in that meeting as a decision maker, but there was value in you being in there as an observer because you noticed something was going to go wrong down the road a little bit later. So we're trying to figure out how to manufacture those. And as a company that that decided to make micro social networks with an algorithmic goal of in real life connection. We obviously are trying to figure out more ways of, of manufacturing opportunities to meet and know people 
in important and authentic ways. Well, that's great. Well, it's good to catch up with you and understand, you know, the shift in the market. It seemed like COVID, as you said, pushed things forward by many years from what it, where it was going anyway. And that's why I saw a lot what was accelerated was going to happen anyway. It just happened faster. What was deaccelerated, mm -hmm. same thing. Uh, brick and mortar was probably overbuilt, was going down anyway. And this just took 10 years and shrank it into, into 10 months and just uh, made it happen much more quickly as well. In the last few minutes that we have here, what else should we cover that we haven't? I think that privacy is going to be big in the next five to 10 years. It's one of the things I'm personally investing in. And when you look at these platforms, one of the things that like DuckGo, for example, if you if people haven't heard of that, it's sort of like a Google, but instead of needing to know, like instead of needing to read your Gmail and read your Google Docs to know more about you to put the right ad to mess with you and what you're gonna do next, DuckGo just uses whatever your search term was, how to let's say it's like how to change a carburetor on an F-150 to put an ad related to that around you. So that's really how magazines used to work. You know, if I bought cigar aficionado, there was a certain type of brand that wanted to be related to that, but they didn't need to know, for example, what Facebook is trying to know about you, which is like, they're one of the largest buyers of ovulation data from Maya, which is the largest cycle tracker for women. The fact that they needed to know that about which ad to put in front of you, I just think is ridiculous. So creating privacy-friendly alternatives to these free tools that all of us are using on the internet is going to be probably one of the largest growth sectors to me in the next five to 10 years. You think that's going to drive microsocial networks, the fact that you have maybe more control over it? You can go to the community curator and they can take care of problems and they can knock out bad actors because you, you want to know who's in your network when it's a small one, when it's, you know, yeah, million, exactly. you, you don't know who is in that network, but if it's a small one, you can actually control who that is and who shares that information. So you think privacy is going to be a big driver for that aspect of it? I think it's going to be huge because we got three patents around meeting other people in real life, because how do I know like 6.6 .6 billion fake identities on Facebook? How do I know the person I'm connecting to is a real person and really the person I'm trying to talk to? I don't know that the guy, the kid playing Roblox with my kid is actually a kid. It's sort of like we're letting children ride their bicycle on the interstate. So privacy to me is, is not just privacy. It's also strong identity. And I think that when you look at the privacy opportunities going forward, it's going to be about how can you get a good return on privacy? Not that it won't be there. I am willing to give Waze and Uber access to my location sensor because they give me a very good return on my privacy, right? So I think you're going to see a lot more like privacy guarantees. Here's what we do with your photos. Here's what we do with your location. Here's what we do with all these things as an opportunity in the future. Well, that's a good, good view on it. It's uh, certainly coming here faster as far as the future goes and certainly seeing a lot of cracks in the big tech world and what it's wrought. And, uh, you know, subscription seems like that's the answer is, is charge for it. And then it cleans itself up. I never saw LinkedIn really have the same issues that Twitter and Facebook had with Rage and other things, which is why it's one of the few, the few, few platforms I'm on because it business professionals doing business work and it, I mean, it seems like it has its place, but it seems like there's there's going to be a major shift here in the next five years, you know, at all levels, government levels, user levels to get to a better place with it. Exactly. I, that's a great point about LinkedIn is there's a freemium tier for people to dabble in like we do for all users. Right. <laughs> and then but paying to to get advanced features is a much better solution, much more elegant than trying to sell my identity. Right. That's a good point. Well, great. I want to thank you for joining us today and hope to have you back for a follow-up soon. Cool. Thanks, all. Thank you for joining us today. As always, be sure to leave a review, subscribe to this podcast, and share it with others. Let's go start up something today. Altine Martin is the director of Investor Connect, which is a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to the education of investors for early stage funding.
All opinions expressed by Hall and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Investor Connect. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for the basis of investment decisions.